Welcome everybody. I'm Andrea Steen. I'm the museum manager of the Hartsville Museum along with Matt Winburn, our assistant manager. I want to thank you for joining us today as we continue to celebrate the Hartsville Museum's 40th anniversary. Today we have a special presentation in our November lecture series and it's about Edward Gay, an American landscape artist. Our guest speaker today will give us a closer look into the life and work of Edward Gay, his art and his connections to Hartsville. As always, we encourage you to ask questions, so please send your questions through Facebook Live and we'll read them to our guest speaker at the end of the lecture. And now, Matt Winburn is going to introduce our guest. Hey guys, thanks for having us. Um, as Andrew mentioned, my name is Matt Winburn, I'm an assistant manager here, and I am very excited to introduce our guest, uh, our guest lecturer today, uh, Mr. Stephen Mott. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, Stephen is the or is the um, curator, excuse me, at the Florence County Museum. So, um, so we're excited to have him to speak on Edward Gay. So, Stephen, do you want to tell us a little about yourself? Um, just a little background information. Uh, sure. I'm uh, from Florence, and I have been interested in art my entire life. I went to Francis Marion University, uh, got a degree in art and art history in 2002. Um, around <clears throat> let's see, 2007, I started working at the Florence County Museum, and that's how I first encountered Edward Gay's artwork. And so in my capacity as the museum's curator, uh, it became our responsibility to know more about him and in doing some research, uh, he became, uh, you know, of special interest to me. And so, uh, right now, I'm planning an exhibition of his work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Well, excellent. And we're all excited to hear more about Edward Gay, his work, and how it connects to our Hartsville community. So, with that, um, Stephen, thanks for joining us. I'm going to turn the floor over to you in your presentation. Oh, all right. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so. Um, I think one of the first uh, things to cover in talking about Edward Gay is, um, you know, if you if you don't already have an interest in 19th century landscape painting, uh, it's a hard it's a hard sell, right? Uh, landscape painting can be so literal that it's difficult for people to see it as being anything more than decorative. But in the 19th century, landscape painting was much more than that. Landscape painting was the sort of preeminent um, subject matter for a serious artist, you know, above portraiture and history painting, uh, and that became especially true in America in the early 19th century uh, with the establishment of Hudson River School. And so that's a that's something that a lot of people are familiar with. If you've never heard of Edward Gay before, fine, <clears throat> but most people I think are familiar in some degree to the Hudson with the Hudson River School. Arts. So I'm going to talk about Edward Gay in the context of the Hudson River School, um, <clears throat> and I just want to show you a few of his paintings uh, first off to get people acquainted with his style and sort of what to expect. So if we can see the next slide. So <clears throat> um, as a landscape painter, Edward Gay, um, <clears throat> he produced, a, I say, a variety of subject matter. I mean, it was all the same subject matter. It's all landscape, but here we can see some, you know, a mountainside, some rolling hills. Next slide, please. Um, waterfall. Next slide. Um, fields of wheat, right? A, a pasture of wheat. Next slide. <clears throat> and this seascape, right? So within landscape painting, there there is a lot of variety in subject matter in Edward Gay's painting, and he was extremely prolific. I mean, he made his living as a painter, supported his family as a painter, uh, so he produced a, a lot of art. Um, hit the next. So uh, here's a photograph of Edward Gay as a young man. Um, he was born in Ireland but immigrated to the United States when he was a young, a young boy, uh, and his family settled in Albany, New York. Um, he like a lot of people who became professional artists in their later life, he was um, maybe a little bit precocious of his talent. And 
His father owned a tavern in Albany and occasionally, as the story goes, every day would exhibit some of these small works on the walls of his father's tavern. Uh, they became noticed by some, uh, some older artists in Albany, namely a Scottish born artist by the name of James Hart, who, who took Evergay in as his protege. And <clears throat> because, because Hart was Scottish, there was an influence of English art, English landscape painting on him. And that, that transferred to Evergay, you see a lot of commonalities with English landscape painting uh, in the early works of Evergay. So if we can see the next slide. So a couple of things to note uh, about uh, early 19th century English landscape painting is it was, it was very literal, it was very picturesque um, with a lot of pastoral scenes of the countryside. It, it mixed landscape painting with genre painting and that just means scenes of everyday people doing ordinary things. <clears throat> So I'm going to give you a lot of background here just to set the scene for, for every day uh, so we can get to the next slide. Um, so here is uh, a very, very typical early 19th century English landscape painting. Uh, you can see the, the genre scene aspect here in the foreground um, with some activity going on, um, some, some men on boat going through what looks like a creek or a canal. <clears throat> Um, and it's showing human beings in, you know, in the greater context of the countryside. So, next slide. Uh, and here's another one by the same artist, John Constable. John Constable was the preeminent early 19th century British landscape painter. And so a lot of artists were taking their cues from his style. He was, he was extremely prolific himself. Uh, and so here we have, uh, again, um, you know, in the larger landscape, some people in the foreground um, and uh, a nice landmark here in the background, this cathedral. The next slide. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's the style in which a lot of early American landscape painting um, sort of existed in, right? In, in sort of that, uh, in, in that same style. So, now we, we talk about uh, 19th century American landscape painting and the Hudson River School, which uh, I've thrown some keywords up here just to help define what that means. And the Hudson River School artists were um, very prominent in the mid 19th century American art scene. Uh, and they were mostly based uh, in New England and New York, and of course that's where Edward Gabe was living. Uh, so it made a lot of sense that we see him intersecting with the Hudson River School. Uh, so Hudson River School artists, they emphasize uh, the monumentality of the landscape. Um, and uh, it was all very technically rendered and very precise. And so there was an emphasis on technical precision and proficiency in the medium of, of oil painting. Uh, and also an emphasis on the, on the divine. Right, that the landscape was some, uh, somehow a manifestation of God's divinity on earth. So <clears throat> although Hudson River School art was also very literal, like early English landscape painting, uh, there was often a lot of exaggeration right, in order to emphasize the, the divine aspect of, of the landscape. You can see that a lot in the works of Frederick Edwin Church, who was an early Hudson River School artist and someone that Edward Gay would have been very familiar with. Uh, and one of his most famous um, paintings of Niagara Falls, obviously a, you know, a huge natural landmark in New York. And this painting is owned by the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., dated 1857. Uh, so you can see but the time period here, uh, and the type of subject matter. <clears throat> so next slide. So uh, here again, we're um, looking at a very well-known Hudson River Valley uh, painting, or Hudson River School, I should say. Uh, but this, this is actually nowhere near the Hudson River Valley. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a painting by Albert Beardstadt of the Sierra Nevada Mountains in California. 
uh, which is owned by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Uh, again, the, the monumentality of it. Mm -hmm. uh, these paintings didn't just depict large vistas. Mm -hmm. um, they were very large paintings themselves. So uh, <clears throat> it's difficult to, to see a reproduction of one of these and really get a sense of the true scale of a lot of these Hudson River Valley uh, paintings, but these paintings would often be, you know, six, seven, or eight feet high, um, and that was to give the viewer a sense of the scale of the subject they were looking at. So we can't really talk about the Hudson River Valley school paintings without talking about the National Academy of Design. Uh, the National Academy of Design in New York was the uh, <coughs> it was the principal art institution in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of its cues from major art institutions in France mm -hmm. and in England. And all of the major Hudson River Valley painters were members of the National Academy. Um, and primarily, um, two Hudson River Valley painters that were founding members of the National Academy of Design in 1825, Thomas Cole and Asher Durand. So we're gonna take a look at a couple of paintings. Uh, so this is a, a painting called The Oxbow, or a View from Mount Holyoke in Northampton, Massachusetts, a New England scene. Again, this is where all the Hudson River Valley painting, painters were painting. Uh, and Thomas Cole uh, was one of the first Hudson River Valley artists to make, put extra emphasis on the spirituality of the American landscape. And although that's something that you don't necessarily see in this painting, you definitely see it in some of his later works. Um, this painting is owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So next slide. And uh, here, um, a painting by Asher Durand, um, uh, one of the founding members of the National Academy. So <clears throat> you see where all of this is coming together, right? And the, the common themes here, you see a massive vista, a monumental landscape where if there are human beings represented in the painting, they're so small as to almost be insignificant and that's very deliberate because Hudson River Valley paintings um, <coughs> were trying to again emphasize the divinity of, of the landscape. So here's a, a, a later painting by Edward Gay and you get a sense, it's one of his larger paintings owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, it's called Broad Acres. It was a scene around uh, his home at Mount Vernon where he, where he later moved after he got married. Uh, um, but we see a little bit of that, right? This is a very large painting. You see a, sort of a sweeping uh, scene of the countryside. So uh, how does Edward Gay uh, um, fit into the Hudson River Valley School of Paintings? Uh, when Edward Gay was a young man, after he had trained with uh, James Hart in Albany, in the 1960s, he uh, um, studied in Germany, right? And then around 1864, uh, he returns to the United States. Uh, he meets a young woman named Martha Beery, uh, who was an art critic. Uh, they get married, and they start a family. And it's it's there that the sort of intersection of Hartsville begins to take place. Uh, <clears throat> sorry for the poor quality image here, but you can see on the right hand side, uh, <clears throat> Edward Gay's daughter, uh, Vivian Gay, who in 1889 married a man named James Wyatt Coker Jr., who your audience might be very familiar with here locally in its association with the Coker Pedigree Seat. So, uh, like her parents, um, Vivian Gay was also artistically inclined and was studying architecture at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, um, when she met James Light Coker, right? And that's how the Gay family becomes associated with the Coker family. Uh, Vivian and uh, James Light Coker, uh, they she moves to, to South Carolina and they take up residence at this house. It's like, this is the Durangalen House on a Coker College, Coker University campus now. Sorry, old slide. Uh, um, and if you were to go into this house now, you would see a lot of Evergate's artwork hanging on the walls. 
So that's that's one point at which Edward Gay's family intersects uh, with parts of South Carolina. Uh, but there's another. Right? After their marriage, uh, the families become uh, better acquainted with one another. And in 1908, Edward Gay's son, Duncan Gay, marries Jenny Coker of Hartsville. Uh, so um, the way that the Florence County Museum acquired its collection of paintings by Edward Gay obviously uh, um, was a result of this intersection. Right? Um, Edward Gay's paintings adorned the walls of the homes of his family members here in Hartsville, and over time, throughout the generations, these paintings became donated to, to local museums. Door Museum has uh, two paintings, yeah, two, two yeah. paintings by Edward Gay. Uh, the Florence County Museum owns six paintings by Edward Gay. Uh, but it wasn't until much long after I had first seen them that I discovered the connection. So a little bit more about Duncan Gay and uh, Jenny Coker, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, Duncan Gay, uh, he, he liked to travel, and uh, he was an artist himself, and uh, so uh, we find a lot of artworks by Duncan Gay out there said, you know, exhibiting the fact that artistic inclination ran in the Gay family. Uh, next slide. Here he is um, with uh, working on a sketch, um, and this Photograph came from the Edward Gay family papers uh, the, uh, art, at the Archives of American Art, which is owned by the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, <coughs> Edward Gay, uh, I'm sorry, Duncan Gay, he, he wasn't just a visual artist like his father, he was also a designer uh, <coughs> and um, not an architect, but he had some capacity you know, with his hands. Uh, and he put that to use in working with the studio of Lewis Comfort Tiffany in, in New York, uh, where he produced, next slide, designs for um, this iconic type of wax that was being produced by, by Tiffany in the early 20th century. Uh, the story is that Duncan Gay met Jenny Coker through the family after his sister's marriage to James L. Coker Jr. And then Jenny Coker uh, invited him to become sort of a contractor to work on this house that she had bought in Connecticut. And after she had hired him to do this work, they fell in love and, and got married. Uh, <clears throat> so all during that time, um, Duncan was working, let's say for over 40 years uh, with Tiffany Studios. Unfortunately, um, Jenny Coker uh, did not live very long after their marriage. I think it was only something like six years. Uh, she died, and then Duncan Gay took it upon himself to raise their daughter. <coughs> um, so, next slide. Uh, here we have an obituary for Duncan Gay. Uh, designer of stained glass windows and son of the artist, Edward Gay. <coughs> um, uh, back in his home in Sharon, Connecticut, to the age of 83. Uh, <clears throat> he had formerly been with Louis Tiffany and his daughter, Susan Linville, of Scarsdale, New York. And it's also through the Linville family that a lot of these surviving Edward Gay paintings were ended up in museums collections. <clears throat> so, um, because Edward Gay had multiple children married into the Coker family, Edward Gay uh, had reason to visit South Carolina. Next slide. So the question is then, did Edward Gay produce artworks in South Carolina? Uh, what you know, connects him artistically, not just uh, through family, but what connects him artistically to, to the area? And uh, probably the most significant example of that is this painting right, of Black Creek. And as you know, Black Creek is a, uh, a tributary of Jeffrey's Creek and that's tributary of the, of, um, the Great Pee River. And so while Edward Gay was visiting Hartsville, he painted paintings like this one. Uh, I believe that he painted this around 1904, 1905. Uh, this painting can be seen uh, at the Drangalen House at Cooper University's campus. 
1905, this painting was awarded a medal at the St. Louis Exposition, uh, and that just illustrates the fact that Edward Gay was, he wasn't just creating paintings to sell them, right, to, to finance his, himself and his family, but he was also a competitive artist who was um, producing large-scale works and uh, exhibiting at salons all over the East Coast. So uh, here we have this painting of Black Creek and other scenes that Edward Gay um, produced while visiting the South. Uh, these coastal scenes, which we believe were from South Carolina and also in Florida. Right? Uh, his son, uh, Duncan Gay, after the death of Jenny Coker, um, bought some property in Florida. Uh, and so we believe that um, one of these paintings is probably from Florida. And, uh, and the one over here on the left most likely from South Carolina. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a painting I also believe uh, to have been a sort of coastal scene from South Carolina. Uh, um, so if we go to the next slide. Uh, <coughs> In addressing uh, Edward Gay's significance uh, here, in looking at the progression of his work from so the early and mid 19th century into the late 19th century, uh, we can see a transition, the reflection of, of changing philosophies within the National Academy. And that's something that I really want to, to focus on. And it's something that's going to be a theme of the exhibition that we're planning at the Florence County Museum. And I think it's very important to do that because Edward Gay uh, became a member of the National Academy when he was very young. Right? Uh, but he was never, he never achieved uh, a sort of full status at the, the National Academy until he was much older. All the while, he was very active in the Academy and he was involved on various committees, um, organizing exhibitions for the, for the National Academy. And he was very, very close friends with a landscape painter by the name of George Ennis, who is arguably one of the most influential 19th century American landscape painters. Uh, <clears throat> so here's um, a photograph of George Ennis, and you can see um, in the background one of George Ennis's canvas, and the scale of it here is also very important because uh, George Ennis, uh, he, he came from the Hudson River School himself, but he also initiated a change in philosophies uh, <clears throat> at the National Academy of Design with respect to landscape painting after taking a trip to Europe in the 1850s, especially visiting France and seeing uh, artwork of the Barbizon School of Painting, which, uh, de-emphasized the technical proficiency with paint and emphasized sort of a kind of spiritualism uh, and evoking a sort of emotional uh, reaction to the painting by using very loose and suggestive brushstroke. And we see that a lot in uh, George Ennis's paintings. So uh, one of the things that I'm sort of focusing on, like I said, is the, the personal relationship between George Ennis and Edward Gay. Uh, you really can't overstate the significance of George Ennis when you talk about 19th century landscape painting. Uh, <clears throat> but to, to show you where George Ennis was influencing Edward Gay, we're going to do some sort of side by side comparisons here. <clears throat> so here's a painting uh, by Edward Gay that's actually owned by Coker University. Um, and you can see it's a, it's a very serene painting um, uh, of the, a sort of the sunset here. There's not a lot of variety in the color palette, um, and that was typical a lot of a lot of these later 19th century American uh, landscape paintings that were influenced by the Barbizon School. Um, <clears throat> they took a tonalist approach, and that meant that they were using color a lot to um, evoke a certain mood. And you see that uh, in this painting by Edward Gay, and also an extremely similar painting by his friend George Ennis. Next. Uh, 
Here's a painting by Edward Gay. This was a smaller, more intimate painting, um, not the sort of sweeping vistas anymore that you saw with the early Hudson River School painters. Um, and, next slide, this pastoral painting by George Ennis. Uh, so you can you begin to see the similarities. And I, I don't think that was coincidental uh, because uh, Edward Gay had a strong affinity for uh, George Ennis as, as a person and um, also as a painter. Next slide. Here again, George Ennis uh, over here on the left uh, and Edward Gay on the right. Um, their personal relationship was so strong that Edward Gay named his youngest son after George Ennis. Uh, George Ennis Gay. And go to the next slide. Uh, um, not to be morbid here, but I'm just showing you um, his name uh, on this on this headstone here. Uh, George Ennis Gay, that was Edward Gay's youngest son. Again, you wouldn't name your child after someone unless they were significant to you in some way. So I think by emphasizing the relationship between George Ennis and Edward Gay, we can start to reframe Edward Gay and get people looking at his artwork in context with what was happening in American landscape painting as a whole uh, looking at the 19th century. Uh, here is um, another painting by George Ennis, and you can see the title of this is Tarpon Springs. Uh, Tarpon Springs uh, is a small community on, on the west coast of Florida Panhandle. And um, George Ennis traveled there because his son owned property there. So we've got Edward Gay's family owning property in Florida, George Ennis's family uh -huh. owning property in Florida, and both the artists traveling to the south, although they both were from New York, uh, to, to paint. Uh, it's just showing a couple of examples of other significant artists who were sort of part of this movement of the change in philosophy and, and 19th century American landscape painting who were also from the South. And this is a, a painting by Elliot Dangerfield, uh, an artist from North Carolina who was also a member of the National Academy of Design. And this painting is owned by the Greenville County Museum of Art and it's entitled Carolina Twilight. So, um, and again, I'm just showing you that uh, although we associate um, academic landscape painting uh, in America with the Northeast, there were absolutely artists who were active in the South, in, in the Southeast, uh, Edward Gay among them. So uh, here is uh, a painting by George Ennis Jr. So just like Duncan Gay uh, followed in his father's footsteps and became an artist, George Ennis's son, George Ennis Jr., followed in his father's footsteps. Uh, and here is a view of Tarpon Springs by George Ennis Jr. Uh, after George Ennis died uh, in the early 20th century, the National Academy started to name uh, certain awards after him. And um, in uh, 1905, here's the next slide, Edward Gay won uh, the George Ennis Gold Medal for one of his paintings entitled Broad Acres, which I showed very early in the presentation. Uh, and here we go. Uh, this is an image of that painting. So George Ennis, it took, I'm sorry, Edward Gay it took a long time in his productive career to, to really get some recognition within the National Academy. Uh, and sort of the, the pinnacle of that was winning this gold medal in 1905. Uh, I told you earlier that he was a member for a very long time at the National Academy, but he didn't achieve full status uh, until 1907, shortly after he had won the George Ennis Award. Here is a small painting by Edward Gay. I'm just going to show you some other comparative images here. George, I'm sorry, Edward Gay against other artists who were part of this tonalist uh, movement that affected American landscape painting. Uh, 
So you can see here that when we compare this to some of those early paintings, especially those pastoral scenes um, or some of those you know, creek side scenes where you see people, like fishermen on a boat or you know, cows and sheep, um, <clears throat> this paintings like this, uh, these, this later one by Edward Day, they were much less normal. Right? And um, they began to take on the, the form of paintings by artists who like George and his obviously you can see a uh, heavy influence of that style of painting on Edward Day's later work. Um, we can also see a similarity between that painting and this painting by uh, Homer Dodge Martin, a well-known uh, late 19th century American landscape painter. And <coughs> next slide. Uh, this is a painting by Edward Gay, uh, simply titled Winter Landscape. This is one of the small Edward Gay paintings that are in the Morristown Museum's collection. And again, this is a, in his later career. Uh, and compare that in style and tone to this painting by Charles Ward Eaton, uh, also a, a well known American landscape painter. Uh, um, and just sort of finishing off here. I don't know how well you can see it on camera, but this is uh, one of Edward Gay's later works. And if you can see in the lower right-hand corner of this painting, it's signed Edward Gay, comma, N.A. And that means National Academy, Edward Gay National Academy. So that means that he would have produced this painting after 1907 when he had been bestowed full status as a member of the National Academy. And although Edward Gay never dated his paintings, you can get a handle on them by looking at the way his style changed over the years. Uh, and especially when you see N.A. after his signature, you know that it's after 1907. And I believe one of the ones in your collection is also N.A. So. <clears throat> so this is just another painting, um, 1911 by Edward Gay. This is in the Florence County Museum's collection. Um, so Edward Gay, he, he lived a, a long life. I mean, he was almost 90 years old uh, when he died in the 1920s. And so he saw American landscape painting change over time. Uh, and he was a part of that change. And I think that's one of the reasons that he's significant and I believe that he's overlooked. Um, it took a long time for anyone to become interested enough in Edward Gay's painting for there to uh, be an exhibition of his work. But next slide. In the 1970s, a descendant of the Coker family uh, took a great interest in Edward Gay's paintings. And they organized an exhibition which traveled throughout South Carolina of his work. And here is just a, a, a copy of the program from that exhibition which and I believe that came to the Hartsville Museum? Right, and we have a copy of this program in our collections if you want to see it later. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, and that's, that's really it. You know, when uh, um, I began looking at Edward Gay, um, I didn't consider him to be anything more than just another 19th century American landscape painter. Um, and. Uh, my attitude was, well, you know, if you've seen them, you've seen one of them, you've seen them all, but the more I looked, uh, the more interesting he became. Um, and especially after finding the connection with George Ennis uh, and, and watching Edward Gay's style change from that early period in the mid 18th century uh, to the later style in the early 20th century, uh, it really, uh, underscored for me the significance uh, of Edward Gay and how important it would be to sort of reinterpret his life. The, um, the last exhibition of his work was the one that was mounted by um, Richard Coker in the 1970s. So it's been over 40 years and I think another look at Edward Gay is, is overdue. So that's what we're planning to do at the Florence County Museum. And I hope you'll keep us uh, in the loop for details for later so our audience can, can take advantage of this. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
Stephen, thanks so much for this fantastic presentation. Um, you've really opened my eyes and really changed our perception about how how to better understand and look at these um, images. And like you mentioned, we have two in our collection, so I, I'm excited to go back and re review these these portraits with a newfound understanding of his work, why he did it, and and like to pull out some of these different little details. Uh, and friends, I invite you to also to come to the museum and view these um, portraits at your leisure. So I have some follow-up questions, Stephen, but first I want to ask Andrea. Andrea, do you have any questions from our Facebook viewers? No, we have several viewers online still, but I think you've given such a great interpretation of his life and his artwork that um, there are no questions right now. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's, that's pretty normal um, with, such, with such a fantastic presentation. Um, but like I said, I, I want to follow up with uh, just a, a couple of of uh, questions from, from your presentation. Uh, if, and I hate to ask you to speculate, but what would you say Edward's um, biggest contribute to the art community would be? And, and what do you think he would want to be remembered for? Well, uh, I think that he might like to be remembered as someone who devoted his life to his art, right? As any true artist would. It's not something that he dabbled in, that he had a moderate amount of talent in, and he picked up here and there as a quote-unquote hobby. Uh, he took it very seriously. And uh, I think it's, when I started talking about him, I said it was, the 19th century landscape painting is kind of a hard sell. You know, it's like 19th century portraiture. Um, you get the feeling after a while that you've seen one, you've seen them all, but when you start to take a much closer look and you see all the nuances, uh, and you can distinguish one you know, portraitist from the next. You can distinguish one landscape painter from the next. And I think that Edward Gay would like to be appreciated for uh, the way that he personally approached landscape painting and how his style was both similar to but different from his contemporary. Mm -hmm. Right. And you mentioned earlier that his family immigrated from Ireland. Um, do you think the immigration or his family roots to Ireland had any effect in his artwork, or was it? Um, you know, he was such a young man at, yeah. the, at the time right. that his family moved from Ireland to the United States that I don't know if there's any direct influence. I believe that that influence really came when he first met James Hart, who was from Scotland. Right. And, uh, and then the influence of English landscape painting on Hart, and that transferred to Edward Gay through his instruction under James Hart. Uh, and then, of course, you know, he, he goes to Germany and he picks up some, um, some technique from his studies in, in Germany, and he brings that back with him, and then he becomes introduced to the, to the Hudson River Valley scene in, in the National Gallery. Right, and you just mentioned again the, the name Hart, and viewers obviously that's no, no connection, connection to Hart's no film, um, but not like we have the connection with the cookers, um, which, you, which you explained earlier, and we really appreciate that. And, and just to dive in a little further, um, as you mentioned, his oldest son Duncan married one of the major daughters, Jenny, and that later begat the Linville family uh, and the Linville Foundation. Um, and then you mentioned also that his um, oldest, or that his uh, one of his, yeah, his oldest, his daughter, oldest son, uh, right, 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 and then his daughter Vivian married Major's oldest son. Sorry, timelines and, and family trees. That's what I've been focused on for the last day or so. And once you get to the Cooker family tree, it gets very, very uh, confusing. There are a lot of branches. There are a lot of branches, but this is an interesting branch because there's so many still relevant um, aspects. Um, for instance, with Vivian and the marriage to James Light Cooker Jr., who was instrumental in Carolina Fiber, which later became Sunoco, um, they had three children themselves. Uh, Gladys, who was the oldest daughter, and that became the, the Fort family, Dorothy, and the Roland family, and as you mentioned, Richard uh, Cooker. For those who don't know, Richard wrote a really fascinating book about Edward Gay, his grandfather, and we actually have two copies at the Harps Museum that I encourage you to come uh, flip through at your convenience. If you can see it, it's a portrait of an American painter, Edward Gay, 1837 to 1928. And I would love to read just a, a brief snippet 
of, of this um, excerpt of this book that I think really uh, draws a nice bridge from everyday Irish American uh, landscape artists to the characters of Parksville. And it goes like this. Keep in mind, this is Richard Coker Grandstein writing this book. The story now to be told is of a visit that came much later when the grandson was 18 years old and becoming a man. On climbing the stairs to the third floor, he found his grandfather seated on the rug-covered couch beneath the north window. Although the old man seemed old, old and decrepit, the remembered easier poor was still there and brought the two to an understanding which was quiet and pleasant. After they had sat a little while, the light faded in the winter dusk, and the old man said with frankness that might have been lugubrious, but was not, I am very old, and I have only a little time to tell you things that I want you to know. He took the book from the shelf at the end of the couch, and reaching behind the books, he brought out a bottle of whiskey. This was in Prohibition days, and such a prize was not easy to come by, nor should it be wasted. He poured two drinks in small glasses that Foresight had provided, and he said, I know you are young to do it, but I want you to have a drink with me, and there may be not many chances. I want you to know that whiskey is good, and that you must not believe those Baptists in South Carolina who say it is not. Whiskey is good. Whereupon they drink to that together. I love that little snippet of the book, and I think it's a nice homage to the Cokers and to the gays, north and south, um, and, and the reflection that it spans over the amount of time. Uh, taking more time, Andrea, any more questions? No, but we did have um, Kathy Moore typed in and asked if she missed the beginning and would she be able to rewatch this video? And my reply is yes. You can watch it on Facebook page or on our website. Absolutely. Um, please, at your leisure, we'll have this video uploaded um, later, in, later in the week for you to watch it at your leisure. While you're on our website, go ahead and go to the left top um, of the screen. There's a little donate button. We rely on donations from you to keep these programs going like our lecture series and other um, programs at the museum going strong. So please consider a donation to the Harps Museum. Um, Edward, or, sorry, Stephen, if people wanted to know more about Edward Gay, um, how could they best reach you? Uh, I can be reached through the contact form on the Florence County Museum's website, so, uh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> or just, you know, just call the museum uh, and ask to speak to me. Perfect. And we'll have all that contact information on our website as well. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. It's been truly a fascinating um, presentation. I've learned a lot. I, hope our view I know our viewers have as well, and I'm hoping that uh, our viewers will take the time to come into the Hartz Museum to view our Edward Gay portraits. I believe the Florence County okay. Museum just opened up, um, reopened to the public as well. Yes. Uh, so take time, even if it's not for the uh, Edward Gay exhibit now, take time to go support your local uh, museums and just get out and do some do things safely, of course. Um, I want to give a one more plug for our next lecture. Um, I don't want to give too much away, but it is a special holiday edition, and it's going to be a big treat, so look for our details to come uh, at a later date. And as always, we thank you for tuning in and making, uh, making our day a little better just by, by supporting the mission of the Arts Museum. So we will see you next time.